Friday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. The Veterans Building is at 401 Van Ness Avenue. The exhibition, co-sponsored by KPFA, is wheelchair accessible. Find more information on the website, mylimemorial.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 o'clock. Stay tuned for Terra Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Howdy, and welcome to today's edition of Terra Verde. I'm your host, Jason Mark. Nothing quite like it had ever happened before. On Wednesday morning, the U.S. Federal District Court for Northern California played host to a five-hour-long climate change science tutorial. Attorneys for San Francisco and Oakland and a lawyer for Chevron Oil, acting as a proxy of sorts for big oil, carefully detailed scientists' understanding of human-driven global warming. The climate science tutorial marked a major milestone. For the first time ever, some of the world's biggest carbon polluters were asked to explain to a U.S. court whether they accept the basic climate change science. The climate change science crash course was one of the first steps in an ambitious legal effort by some cities and counties to hold the major oil, gas, and coal companies liable for the damages from climate change-related weather disasters and the costs they're already paying to, to take care of things like rising sea levels and more frequent wildfires. Eight California cities, including San Francisco, Oakland, and Richmond, are suing the fossil fuel giants. At the beginning of this year, New York City filed a similar suit against the five biggest non-state-owned oil companies. So really, how big of a deal are these lawsuits? Do they have a chance of success? And what are the carbon polluters doing to try to avoid any legal accountability for climate change-related costs? Well, here to walk us through that issue and others is Michael Berger. He's the executive director of the Sabine Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University Law School. Also with us is David Pine. He's a county supervisor in San Mateo County, and that's one of the California jurisdictions suing the oil companies. Michael and David, welcome to Terra Verde. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Glad to have you both. David, let's start with you. Um, So why did you and your colleagues on the San Mateo uh, County Board of Supervisors, why did you all decide you had to file a lawsuit against the major oil companies and other fossil fuel corporations? San Mateo County uh, is, by many measures, the most threatened county in the entire state of California to sea level rise. We have been uh, very focused on this issue for a number of years to try to plan for the type of adaptation that we will have to uh, implement in the light of the rising bay. And uh, we felt that it was time to hold the uh, fossil fuel producers accountable for uh, contributing to global warming uh, uh, and for essentially causing, you know, our our county to have to invest billions of dollars to adapt. And I've read your complaint, but just walk the listeners through a little bit. I mean, what kind of costs are we talking about? I mean, we're talking about, you know, roads and and causeways, bridges that might might be impacted by sea level rise, other infrastructures there that, that the county owns? Um, yes, San Mateo County is uh, has a, uh, a bay shore where most of our uh, residents and businesses and infrastructure is uh, located. Um, we uh, uh, have, uh, you know, literally billions of dollars of uh, uh, enterprise along the bay shore, and all of it is threatened by sea level rise. Uh, for those familiar with our county. Uh, when you go down 101, uh, you know, everything towards the east uh, will be uh, inundated uh, without protective measures being put in place. Uh, the county has conducted a, an extensive sea level rise vulnerability assessment to look at uh, different scenarios and the type of uh, damage that would occur 
uh, depending on the amount of sea level rise that uh, takes place. So if we look out to uh, 2100, where we see uh, likely three feet of sea level rise and combine that with a storm event and high tides, uh, we estimate over $30 billion of damages. And this would include, uh, again, residents, commercial enterprises, roads, stormwater plants, um, you know, San Francisco Airport, of course, is in the bay. Uh, it would uh, be crippling uh, for our county if we are not able to adapt to these rising uh, sea levels. So essentially you're saying that your county is going to be on the hook for an estimated $30 billion in, in I guess, essentially, you know, climate change retrofits and that you want the, the oil and gas companies and coal companies to, to pay for some of that. Yeah, absolutely. They are uh, the contributors to this problem, and they need to uh, be held accountable and and uh, help fund these adaptation measures. Michael Berger, you're there at Columbia University Law School, obviously follow this stuff pretty closely. Is, is there been anything like this before? And if so, how have those past lawsuits, how have they, how have they fared in, in, in the courts? There have been a few lawsuits along these lines in the past. Uh, there was a lawsuit that was filed by the state of Connecticut and a number of other states and cities um, against five, the five largest utilities in the United States. And this was back in the mid 2000s when George W. Bush was in the White House. Um, And that lawsuit eventually went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found that that lawsuit had been what's called displaced by the Clean Air Act. Uh, The gist of that being that because Congress had given the Environmental Protection Authority, the uh, agency, the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, there was no room left for a federal public nuisance uh, lawsuit against these companies. Uh, Around that same time, there was another lawsuit filed actually against fossil fuel companies. And this was a lawsuit that was filed by the native village of Kivalina in Alaska. Uh, and that was a lawsuit that was directly against ExxonMobil and some of the other defendants in these lawsuits. And what they were asking for was damages um, to assist with the costs of relocation because the native village of Kivalina is at extre- extreme risk of um, of being of, of going underwater due to sea level rise. And after the Supreme Court's decision, ultimately the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco decided that that lawsuit also couldn't proceed under this federal common law nuisance theory. Uh, there have been a couple of other cases that have also sort of taken this common law tort approach to climate change, seeking to get some sort of compensation or damages from one or another set of, of actors um, within the fossil fuel sector or otherwise. None of them has gone to trial. Um, all of them have been dismissed at some preliminary stage based on a number of different legal rationales. Um, and, um, and, and this case is at a, point, is at a moment where we're, we're about to see whether it's going to go away or whether it'll, it'll stick around for a while. You mean because the defendants, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, BP, at all, have got a motion to dismiss. They want to, they want to have these, the, the judge throw these out. Exactly. Uh, they, they've filed a motion to dismiss the Oakland and San Francisco cases, which um, have been converted. Originally, all of these lawsuits in California were filed under state law, under California state law. Uh, and what the, what the district court judge did in the San Francisco and Oakland cases was basically convert those, those claims into federal common law nuisance claims, uh, which is kind of unusual. Um, but puts the case in a certain posture. And and so now there's a motion to dismiss pending there. In the other cases involving San Mateo County and others, um, a different judge found that similar claims um, could proceed under California state law and that they should go back to to California state court. 
so those cases are in a slightly different position. Um, one way or the other, we ex- I do expect to sort of see these motions to dismiss these cases moving forward uh, relatively soon. Um, David Pine, you're, uh, in addition to being a supervisor there in San Mateo County, my understanding is you're also an attorney. Um, what makes you confident that your case will succeed where some of these others have not? Again, as Michael Berger was saying, um, you know, got thrown out um, essentially because the Supreme Court said they were they were preempted by the Clean Air Act. Well, what's particularly distinctive about our case is that we are bringing uh, state common law claims, and those have uh, you know not uh, been litigated or precluded by some of the federal precedent. And I'm particularly uh, optimistic because of the oil industry's long record of deceiving the public about the uh, risks and damages that their products uh, uh, cause. Uh, as we point out in our complaint, it's you know really quite amazing when you look at the period between 1965 and 2015. That was 75% of the world's greenhouse gases were emitted. And uh, uh, in 1965, you know, Lyndon Johnson's Scientific Advisory Committee you know, reported that uh, uh, CO2 emissions would, by 2000, alter the climate. So uh, we've known for a long time uh, about the risks of these products, and the oil companies have known for a long time. And they systematically uh, spent uh, considerable resources to try to confused the public about what was happening and what was happening to to the planet's climate. They knew that climate was changing. Uh, They knew that fossil fuel production was causing it. And uh, frankly, they lied about it and paid other people to to lie about it and profited from it. So uh, those sort of actions combined with state common law claims, I think, puts them, um, uh, you know, puts us in a good position to seek uh, redress in the court. I'm glad you mentioned that that LBJ factor. I think it's stunning to a lot of people to learn that, in fact, in the 1960s, and it got lost amid, you know, the Vietnam the Vietnam War and other things like uh, the historic civil rights movements. But in fact, in a State of the Union address, uh, Lyndon Johnson warned about climate change, uh, you know, almost more than 50 years ago. It's kind of stunning. So yesterday's um, uh, or the, the tutorial that occurred in the in the court earlier this week uh, was very uh, important. It was very uh, important to hear the oil industry uh, state that there's really no debate about the climate science because for a long time they were not willing to say that. And we'll come back to that point about what happened in the uh, in the courthouse on Wednesday. I was there, but I want to bring it back to you, Michael Berger. Um, so Supervisor Pine was saying um, uh, that, you know, the, the oil companies knew and tried to mislead the public. But even if we accept that as a given, how are these complaints making the case and trying to connect climate change to these specific companies? Um, I mean, it's one thing. I'm wondering if you could walk us through some of the science that we see in these lawsuits trying to say, actually, we can we can, you know, track emissions or we can track part of the emissions pie to these actors. It's, it's, we haven't quite seen how that's going to play out yet, um, but it is a really important question, and it's a, it's a problem that has uh, sort of plagued these lawsuits in the past. The defense that the that the fossil fuel companies are raising now is a similar defense that they've raised in the past, both in court and in sort of public discourse when talking about this uh, to the media and, and elsewhere, which is climate change is a global problem. It comes from everywhere on the planet, um, including fossil fuel emissions, but also including deforestation, land use degradation, and so forth and so on. Um, and the sources are not just the the producers of fossil fuels, but all of the users, which includes all of us. Um, And you can see how that works as both a sort of general argument, we shouldn't be held to blame for something that everybody's responsible for, but it also is a particular legal argument because what the plaintiffs have to show in order to ultimately win these cases is that these actors are both the actual cause uh, of, of their harms and also the so-called legal cause or approximate cause, um, which ties together notions both of sort of a physical relationship 
but also more of a kind of legal and moral notion of of the of blameworthiness. Um, and they've argued that they are at the very beginning of a long chain of um, activities that ultimately lead to the combustion on a global scale, creating a global problem. And that is a real problem um, for, for plaintiffs to get over. In, in a generic sense, they've, uh, plaintiffs have succeeded in some cases where you're challenging government actors to, to do something that they haven't already done um, and to get standing to sue in those instances. But we haven't yet had a court firmly say, because of that long chain of causation, one, one particular party can be held responsible. Now, in addition to that, here we have a specific issue of tracing specific emissions back to fossil fuel producers, who, as I just said, they're not the ones actually combusting the fuel. Um, they're not the power plants. They're not the automobiles. They're not the large-scale industry. Um, they're the they're ones pulling it out of the ground. And so even though there are emissions associated with that, um, the those direct emissions are a small part of the problem, relatively speaking. Um, so there are methodologies that uh, a few scientists have developed to sort of trace a specific number of emissions back to fossil fuel companies based on the quantity of uh, oil, gas, and coal they've put into the market. Um, and those numbers wind up allocating 1%, 2%, 3% of um, global emissions to these individual companies. One test will be, if this gets that far, whether those methodologies um, stand up in court and um, are enough to prove that these companies should be held financially responsible. That was Michael Berger speaking. He's the director of the Sabine Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University Law School. Also here with us today is David Pine. He's a county supervisor for San Mateo County which is among the California jurisdictions suing the oil, gas, and coal corporations for climate change-related damages. And that's what we're talking about here today on Terra Verde. So, David, I want to bring it back to you. So, and that was for, for some of the folks who caught it, we were talking about it on the morning show here on KPFA yesterday. Um, so, Chevron, which again was acting as a proxy of sorts for uh, the other defendants, basically said at the beginning or, or close to the beginning of this climate tutorial – it said, you know, climate that Chevron accepts the basic science around climate change um, and then but then went on, of course, to sort of try to litigate the case. Um, and the Chevron uh, attorney said it's not energy production and extraction that's driving this temperature increase. It's it's how people are leading their lives. So, um, David Pine, what's what's your response to that, that, well, we're all you know, there's all sorts of San Mateo residents driving up and down um, Highway 101 there. Um what distinguishes, what makes these giant actors like Chevron and Exxon uniquely culpable? Well, I think the key point is is that for decades they did not make the public or the consumers aware of the dangers of their products when they absolutely knew that uh, consumption of fossil fuel would lead to global warming and rising sea levels. Um, you know, there are similar cases when we look back at tobacco litigation or the lead paint cases um, uh, that did have parallels. So when, um, you know, was it the fault of a homeowner to use um, the paint uh, sold by uh, the paint manufacturers uh, uh, in their homes? Um, if homeowners had known about the risk of that paint, they might have done something different. You know, if if the oil companies were um, truthful uh, decades ago, I think um, we would be in a very different place now. I think the uh, demand for alternative energy would have um, come on the scene decades sooner. Uh, I think public policy would have uh, evolved in, in tremendously different ways. So the uh, fossil fuel companies um, basically facilitated this use of uh, their product by failing to disclose the, the risks entailed. And that lead paint, uh, again, I'm not an attorney, but that lead paint um, analogy uh, does seem to be sort of what is being echoed in some of these lawsuits. Actually, the opening line of the New York City complaint reads, this lawsuit is based upon the fundamental principle that a corporation that makes a product causing severe harm when used exactly as intended should shoulder the cost of abating that harm. Um, 
But Michael Berger, I want to come back to you th- about this big tobacco um, analogy that everybody loves to use. You know, uh, there in New York City, when Mayor Bill de Blasio announced um, the New York City lawsuit against the five biggest non-state-owned oil companies, I mean, he made, he he very clearly mentioned big tobacco and, in fact, put big tobacco and big oil in the same sentence. Do you think that holds up? Do you think that 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 there there are there are accurate parallels there? Absolutely. I mean, in, in just in the in the sense that David was talking about, there are. There's a clear analogy to a long history of smoke screens, um, obfuscation, seeking intentionally to blur um, the public's understanding about the nature of the risk that the product presents. And in that in that sense, it's a, it's a, the analogy is is very clear. And and the fact of that knowledge is relevant, both I think in terms of the, the sort of moral imperative of placing blame, but also. Uh, in a legal sense, in, in attributing sort of responsibility um, and knowledge to to the to the industry, but it's also quite clearly different, right? For the same reasons that I was talking about before, with a cigarette, you have a very short chain of causation from the company that manufactures and uh, markets and sells the product to single consumers who consume it, um, and get cancer as a result. Um, it's, a, it's a very direct uh, relationship. Here in the, in the climate change context, the science is much different. There are far more actors. And in this particular instance, you have a lot of intervening actors in between BP, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, and so forth and so on, and the actual combustion of the fuels. Um, and so because of that, the, the, there are key differences in the analogy that I think may have some legal salience, um, but certainly allow the the industry to push back against the analogy. Um, we'll come back to industry pushback in, in just a minute because it is interesting what Exxon Mobil um, among among the, the defendants is doing. But on this chain of causation, uh, Michael Berger, I mean, there's got to be, though, do you think it will influence the courts at all, just the advances in, let's call it the raw science we've seen since, say, those um, Bush-era lawsuits against the carbon uh, the, the carbon polluters? And what I'm thinking of here is, you, know, you think about Hurricane Katrina, you think about Superstorm Sandy, and a lot of folks, including environmentalists and killing reporters, have been very um, circumspect at that time about about making you know real links between those storms and greenhouse gas emissions, but you look back at 2017 where we had this unprecedented chain of disasters. Um, you are, we are seeing, in fact, science just being much more confident about being able to link disasters and the and the cost of those disasters to climate change. Is that do you think that's going to influence at all how the courts how the courts view these cases? Uh, I, I think that there. The, the science is at different points for different types of impacts, uh, and it's at different points when you're talking about understanding the general increased risk of certain types of events and the ability to articulate a, um, to attribute the, a specific event to, to climate change. Um, so I think that the, it, what you're saying is absolutely right. The science has advanced significantly in the last 10 years, and there's no doubt that um, extreme storms, um, this, the 2017 hurricane season, um, the California wildfires, all of these quite clearly have some connection to climate change. Um, the methodology is available to scientists to pinpoint the relationship between a particular hurricane or a particular wildfire, um, those methodologies are at different stages and may or may not ultimately prove persuasive to a court um, at, this point in, at this point in time. Um, but certainly the general notion that we know that there's increased intensity, increased frequency of these sorts of extreme events, um, and that that's a result of climate change is, is 100% clear. Um, saying that this particular fire was because of climate change and that these particular damages that resulted from the fire um, should be blamed on climate change raises a different set of is- issues. Sure. Um, if I could add... Yes, to, please, I, David. I think the science has certainly come a long way in, in its ability to attribute um, you know, specific uh, uh, 
uh, carbon emissions to specific producers. You know, in our complaint, uh, we detail how these uh, uh, named plaintiffs are responsible for approximately 20% of the total CO2 emission uh, during the 50-year period between 1965 and 2015. So um, the, the sophistication of the analysis has uh, uh, really uh, been enhanced in recent years. Sure, it's, more, it's, more e- it's easier than ever before to detect the signal among all the noise. One of you were talking about uh, a pushback from the industry. Let's talk about actual legal pushback. So um, just around the same time that New York City lawsuit was filed, um, one of the major plaintiffs, uh, ExxonMobil, um, filed a petition in Texas state court um, claiming that some of these California cases are, quote unquote, a conspiracy and that um, they infringe or possibly violate the the company's um, uh, constitutionally uh, protected right to free speech. Michael, I'm wondering how you would characterize that legal maneuver, that sort of, I guess, you know, kind of counter um, counterattack by ExxonMobil. Well, it seems to me to be without any foundation in law. Um, you know, the idea that um, cities are conspiring to exercise their ability to file lawsuits based on plausible legal claims is, is nonsense. Um, and so I, I don't think that the claims really have any any kind of legal merit. And, and they're consistent with a long history of sort of what are called slap suits, lawsuits that are intended to um, uh, intimidate um, protesters and intimidate environmental groups and intimidate local governments uh, and dissuade them from pursuing litigation or, or their advocacy efforts. And David, what was your reaction when you heard that possibly uh, he, you and, and your colleagues there on the San Mateo uh, County Board of Supervisors might be subpoenaed by ExxonMobil over these cases? Well, in the uh, uh, this counterattack by the, uh, the industry, in fact, uh, our, our our county council was named as a defendant. Our county manager was named as a defendant. Uh, the board of supervisors was not. I suppose that could happen someday. And uh, so it's uh, it's preposterous. And I think it you know it it just points out uh, that the oil industry uh, is ready to use scorched earth tactics in their in defense of uh, uh, of this case. Um, presumably, they think that it will deter others from bringing such cases. I suspect that uh, uh, many more cities and counties around the nation will uh, bring similar litigation. Uh, and ultimately, uh, uh, it doesn't speak doesn't speak well for their for their industry to bring frivolous claims of, the, of this kind. We've got just about a minute left, Michael Berger. Um, do you think that's right? Do you, do you expect um, similar lawsuits? And, and one other question for you in our last minute here. What what are the next steps here, uh, say, over the next, you know, couple of months? So uh, I think the next steps here are in the San Francisco and Oakland case, we're going to have this motion to dismiss litigated in one way or another. Um, and so uh, within the next six months or so, I think we should expect to see a decision on whether those, that, those cases are going to proceed. Um, the other cases um, are a bit of a trickier procedural moment, so the, the, time, the timeline there is a little less clear to me. In terms of other cities uh, or counties jumping in, filing copycat suits in other cities or states, uh, that could well happen. I would expect that many are waiting to see what happens on these first motions to dismiss in the Oakland-San Francisco cases and also the one filed in New York uh, City. Well, I want to thank you both for taking the time to join us today. Again, you've been listening to Michael Berger from the Columbia University Law School and then David Pine, a county supervisor there in San Mateo County, which is one of eight California jurisdictions suing the oil, coal, and gas companies for climate change-related damages. That's all the time we've got for today's show. Thanks to Engineer Janine Etter. Uh, This show and others are available online all the time at kpfa.org for your convenience. Have a great weekend. You are listening to Terra Verde on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno.
Saturday, 9 a.m., join KPFA for live coverage from Democracy Now! of the March for Our Lives. The protests by student activists is calling out the NRA and powerful lawmakers and demanding an end to gun violence. Politicians who sit in their gilded house and senate seats funded by the NRA telling us nothing could have ever been done to prevent this. We call BS! 9 a.m. to noon, Saturday on KPFA 94.1 and